Every investor needs to know about asset allocation, but do you really know what you need to know about it? Well, joining me to discuss that is Sebastian Page, who just wrote a book called Beyond Diversification. Sebastian is head of global multi-asset at T. Rowe Price. Sebastian, welcome. Hi, Bob. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So um, let's start with the title of the book. Um, Everyone thinks that diversification is the end-all be-all when it comes to uh, portfolio construction, that if I own some assets that go up and some that go down and on balance, uh, it, they all offset each other, that I've, I've done my job. But you seem to imply that that's, there's something beyond that. Absolutely. But look, if you give me 30 seconds to give a, an investor investment advice, say uh, we're going up an elevator and we have two floors and I have to give advice, I'm going to say, stay invested for the long run and diversify. So I'm not arguing against the principle of diversification. I would argue it's one of the most important pieces of advice you could give someone if you only have 30 seconds to talk about investments. But the book is titled Beyond Diversification because Diversification in the way it's interpreted by many people is a flawed concept. And allocating your assets goes way beyond diversification. The book's organized in three sections. There's a section about forecasting returns, forecasting risk, and then a section on portfolio construction. And I have model portfolios in there. But let me just say quickly why diversification can be a flawed concept in itself. First of all, you know, very simple question. What do you diversify across? The way we present investment choices to people really influences what portfolio they end up with. And there's a study by uh, Richard Thaler and he's a Nobel Prize laureate where they took 401k plan menus that were very different. And then they calculated how people were allocated on average. And here's an example of how the menu itself, what do you diversify across, really matters. There was a plan where they had about nine equity funds on the menu and one bond fund. Guess what? Most people ended up with very high equity allocations, 80% plus on average. Yeah. There was another plan where they had nine bond fund and one equity fund. Guess what? Everybody ended up with a conservative portfolio. Yeah, well, I think it's so, called what uh, one over n, isn't it? Something right. Like that. And there's, there's a tendency towards one over n. So when we say diversify, stay invested for the long run, this is simple advice. But there's a lot of thinking, and there's a lot of subtlety around how you do that. You do that exact exactly. And I explain in the book also that you know, diversification doesn't necessarily work the same in different market environments. And this is something that people know, that the pros know, but that as an industry, we underestimate the impact of that. And that is the fact that when markets sell off, and we've just seen, seen this in COVID, all the correlations go up, especially across risk assets. That's well known. People like to say correlations go to one. They don't really all go to one, but Things that in normal markets don't move together in your portfolio, like credit, you know, corporate bonds and stocks, all of a sudden when stocks are down by 10, 15%, all start moving together. So you lose the diversification effect. Okay, that's, that's fairly well known. Diversification doesn't necessarily mean hedging the downside. And that's pretty important, right? So what do you do, again, beyond diversification? Now, here's the issue though. When, Bob, when, when do you think diversification works the absolute best historically? Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I should no, that's say. all right. I, I don't mind flunking this test um, uh, during bear markets. So it works, it works the absolute worst during bear markets. And you can, I showed in the book, if you take the 5% worst monthly returns for the U.S. stock market in history, you get the highest correlations, you get everything moving together. If you take the 5% best monthly returns for US stock markets, when, when stock markets rally, you get fantastic diversification. Correlations go way down, they become negative. This applies, for example, 
to the diversification between international non-US stocks and US stocks. Works really, really, really well when you really don't want it in up markets and really badly in down markets. So this asymmetry really should influence how people think about building portfolios. It, it means we should focus a lot more on the diversification between stocks and bonds and especially treasuries because that type of diversification works differently than between US stocks, non-US stocks, value stocks, growth stocks, and so on. It also means that we should look for assets or portfolio solutions that behave in the way we intend diversification to work during sell-offs. So this has just a lot of implication with how we construct portfolios. And that's why in the book, I end up showing model portfolios where you focus on downside risk exposure. Um, really, I, I think it's an important concept. It's well known, right? But uh, there's, a, th there's, there's kind of a lack of attention to this, I think, still across our industry. Yeah. So would it be appropriate to talk about your seven rules of thumb for portfolio construction at this moment? I, I know there's lots that we could talk about and, and will, but do um, you want to talk about the, your seven rules? Uh, yes, Bob, thank you for that question. I have rules of thumb for each section of the book and portfolio construction is in my mind, the most important one. So here they are. First, I talked about not using risk factors, which is the new trend here. This is a new concept in our industry as substitutes for asset classes. I don't think there's a need to overhaul portfolio construction to move away from asset classes towards risk factors. But I also explain that risk factor analysis for the pros at least, uh, those that have the tools to do it can be quite useful for risk forecasting. But there's no need to rethink portfolios and get, a, get, get away from asset classes towards risk factors. Second, um, that is the recommendation, is to use risk factors, but more to assess portfolio diversification, uh, forecast risk, and enhanced scenarios. So here's one way to think about it. If you're invested in stocks and high-yield bonds, with your high-yield bonds, you have, in part, some stocks-like or equity-like exposure. So when we talk about risk factors, uh, this is... Uh, this, this is how we talk about diversification is the fact that this portion of high yield bonds that looks and acts like a stock, especially in down markets, is all part of the same risk factor. So rethink diversification that way. Um, for those popular products nowadays that look at risk premia, uh, where you can get access to the value factor, uh, you can even get it through ETFs, for example, right? Or get access to the small cap uh, factors. Those can be interesting as part of portfolio construction, but uh, in my book, I explain that you really need to be careful with backtest results and that those probably command a relatively small allocation. And there's a handful of them like the volatility premium that, uh, or the low risk premium uh, that can perform well over time um, or that at least have shown good results in a robust academic studies. Okay, so we're at three. Uh, number four, uh, first question any investor needs to solve for portfolio construction is what is your stock bond mix? This is the most important question you need to solve for. And it really influences your long-term results. In the book, I talk about how to do that as a function of how far you are from retirement. But remember that how much you should allocate to stocks and bonds also depends on what capital markets can offer going forward. What is the long run expected return on stocks and bonds? And that should influence your allocation. How well funded are you? Basically, do you have enough money set aside so that if you assume reasonable growth in your portfolio and steady contributions, you'll have a pot that's big enough at retirement to replace your salary once you retire? And if you're way below that, that might change your stock bond allocation. So, Bob, you can see really quickly that there's so many ways to think about this problem, so many variables to take into account. I think Bill Sharp described this problem as one of the thorniest, hardest problems in finance, this life cycle 
investing decision. And the crux of it is how much stocks should I hold relative to bonds? That single decision is quite important. In our target date strategies, for example, if you're 50 years old, so you have about 15 years to retirement, the answer to how much stocks should you own is might actually be higher than most people think. Um, in our target date strategies, you would be at 80% stocks at 50 years old, and then you'd glide down towards 55 uh, once you turn 65 years old. Here's the thing, right? Your retirement date is not a magic date. You need your portfolio to sustain your income in retirement for your entire life. 20 years, 25 years, 30 years post-retirement. So the answer, very important, determine your stock bond mix first. It's a key decision. That's my rule of thumb. How you apply that rule of thumb uh, can be complex, but when in doubt, look at target date strategies because they provide a good anchor point. Um, so meet, try, try to match your risk tolerance. Um, number five, use portfolio, um, use portfolio modeling analytics if you have access to them or if, you're in a, or if your advisor has access to them. Use judgment and experience to construct the portfolio under the broad stock bond mix. Once you've solved for the broad stock bond mix, you start asking questions. Okay, how should I allocate my stocks? Should I have international exposure? Should I have balanced value and growth stocks exposure? And then similar questions for the bond side. Sixth rule of thumb, I do think that investors, now even individual investors need to consider alternatives, whether liquid or less liquid alternatives that are now available more broadly. I don't think they are a free lunch, but in a world where interest rates are very low and bonds won't give you the same diversification going forward, alternatives have a place in investors' portfolio. And uh, for example, in some of the model portfolios, I substitute about 12% of the bond allocation for low volatility alternatives. Uh, seventh rule of thumb, of thumb I, I, my view is that uh, most investors should allocate uh, between active and passive strategy as a function of risk tolerance. In a low return world, active management done well can deliver excess return over time. And that can become an important part of portfolio construction for investors. A lot of investors nowadays end up with some mix of active and passive, which to me makes sense. So Bob, it's a long answer, but those are the rules of thumb for portfolio construction that I talk about in the third section of the book. Right, and then in one section, you mentioned the sample portfolios for different uh, investment objectives and, and different ages. Do you wanna just sort of briefly give us a overview of what folks uh, will see in that uh, section? Yeah, a popular question these days is, is the 60-40 traditional portfolio dead? I don't think it's dead, but it needs some tweaks given current market conditions, what we can expect going forward from capital markets, and advances in portfolio construction and asset allocation. So you start from a 60-40, first of all, you ask, going back to one of my rules of thumb, what is my stock bond mix as a function of my time horizon and risk tolerance? 60-40 is very generic advice, but that's not really the spirit of the question. The spirit of the question is, what should we do beyond traditional stocks and bonds, right? Uh, burgers and beers, right? Traditional asset classes. Um, in one of the models portfolio, one of the model portfolios I showed, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, I substitute twelve percent from the bonds to alternative types of assets. I also swap about five to ten percent of the equity allocation for risk mitigated equity products. Those are becoming more available on advisor platforms, for example. Those strategies typically seek to deliver, say, 70, 80% of the return of equities with as little as half of the exposure to loss or the volatility. So this concept of risk mitigated equities is making it, it's, it's used a lot on the institutional space and is making its way to the individual investor space. Because rates are so low, I also create a dedicated allocation to long bonds. So in a in a 60-40, I'd probably put 
three, four, five percent to long bonds because that's where you can still get a rally should equity markets crash, right? Rates can still go down in the long end, a better hedge going forward. So those are some of the changes I mentioned. Risk factor exposure, we put about 5% in the volatility risk premium. It still has high downside correlation with equities, but it has some interesting features. So to summarize, 60-40 is not dead. It needs some tweaks. And first of all, it's generic advice. Depending on your goals, you could be 80-20, you could be 30-70. But beyond that, as far as what you put in, uh, think alternatives, risk mitigated equities, uh, and uh, risk premium and long bonds. Those are the types of improvements we can make over traditional portfolios. Right. So um, one other question has to do with uh, rebalancing. Obviously, everyone is told to do that when uh, a portfolio, um, maybe the asset uh, allocation goes out of whack by five percentage points or 10 percentage points. What's your thought about when people should rebalance and why? You know, I've done a few studies on rebalancing and found that of the ways you can rebalance, right? You can look at the calendar and say, okay, I'm going to rebalance every quarter, every year. I'm going to rebalance every month. Or you can put some bands around it and say, okay, I'm going to rebalance when I'm kind of plus or minus 5% my target. Of all the ways you can rebalance, generally speaking, it's more efficient to have tolerance bands than just rebalance based on the calendar. So that's finding number one. Finding number two is that generally it pays over time to be contrarian and rebalancing helps investors do that with some discipline. We've done studies of stock market sell-offs. We've looked at 17 of them going back about a hundred years. And if you lean into the markets, when you become underweight in your stock allocation, over time it pays off. You don't need to time the bottom perfectly. You can be off by a month on either side or by five, six percent on either side or more. Over time, it's good discipline to bring your equity allocation back to its target when everyone else is panicking. And if you have the liquidity to do that, it pays off over time. Mm -hmm. So the other side of that is that when equities rally too much beyond your target weights, you can bring them back. So Bob, it's kind of the simple story is it's probably better to use bands, tolerance bands, than just simple calendar-based rules. And it pays over time to be contrarian. So rebalancing, all else being equal, is good investment discipline. Right. So uh, some money managers I've spoken to talk about putting in place bands of different um, degrees so that for emerging markets, where there's more volatility, you might have a wider band. And for, I don't know, the S&P 500, you might have a more narrow band. Any thoughts about sort of using different bands for different asset classes? Absolutely. Uh, there are at least four different levels of complexity and sophistication around how you put bands on your asset mix to come up with rebalancing rules. Simplest, okay, use the same band across all asset classes. A little bit more complex, but can work better, uh, put wider band for more volatile asset classes, which I think is what you're suggesting. Even more complex, take into account, and this you get more into the institutional, you need to have the analytics to do it, but take into account the total portfolio risk in setting your bands. So now you're talking about what we call in quant, in, in quant talk, marginal risk contributions and size your bands that way. And if you want to get really fancy, and I don't think it adds a ton more value, but we studied this, then you go into optimization of the bands and it becomes a multi-period problem where you end up with dynamic risk-aware bands. I don't, I don't think for most investors it makes sense or adds a lot of value to get all the way there, but you can see the continuum of how to do that. And just having simple a simple set of bands and having wider ones for more volatile asset classes, probably the sweet spot for most people. Yeah. So um, anything that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to mention or anything that you've touched upon that you want to reemphasize? Uh, I think the book Beyond Diversification really is all about professional asset allocation, 
and looking at innovations in that space. Um, it's, it's a book that challenges you to learn. Uh, I reviewed over 200 different academic papers on the subject, my own research, uh, my experience with colleagues at T. Rowe Price. So uh, th there's a lot in there, but I think it's a, it, it's a rewarding read for those willing to put in, put in the time to learn more about asset allocation. It's just a fascinating field. Mm. I, I came away thinking much the same, Sebastian, that this is a book, not necessarily for the average investor, but for the person who's a student of the subject and, and wants to learn uh, as much as possible about it. Yeah. And when I set out to write this book, I was thinking about Malcolm Gladwell, who I'm, I'm no Malcolm Gladwell. He's, he's a fantastic, popular writer. Uh, I was thinking about that style, though, where you take some complex topics that are important and boil them down to the intuition and the practical conclusions, but not in a way that sacrifices the rigor behind it. So that's kind of what I had in mind when I wrote the book. Yeah. Well, it's great. I hope uh, people read it because of our interview. Thank you. Likewise.